Uh, yes, uh, uh, grace and peace, good morning. Well, good afternoon, Beacon Church. How are we doing today? So this, this, I heard this is the group I, I, will, I, I get the most energy from because you had the most sleep. So I, I'm, I'm expecting you know, a lot of energy, you know, uh, from you. But I'm excited. Pastor uh, Robert, thank you so much for the invitation. Pastor uh, Trevor and the whole team, thank you for the hospitality. I'm excited uh, to be here. And my name is Pastor Jamar Bernard. I am uh, uh, the lead pastor of Christian Culture Center. My father is a founding pastor. And I bring greetings from our family at uh, called CCC. I bring greetings from my wife of uh, 26 years, right? 26, bar from the tennis column, right? Yes, 26 years. <laughs> She's not going to watch this, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, and my uh, five kids, I got, uh, yes, five kids. Uh, thank you. See, somebody's excited about having a lot of kids. <laughs> They're expensive. Uh, we only wanted two. Um, but once again, um, you know, I, she, she, she just couldn't say no to all of this. And, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm excited. I have three girls, two boys. My oldest is 24. My youngest is eight. The eight-year-old is the boss of the house. And, and my two sons, I said, look, just, just, just let it go, bro. Just let it go. You know, it's my wife, uh, when she was pregnant with the last one, and it was the, the two older girls, and, you know, they all start syncing up, if you all know what I mean, right? And so, uh, so they're watching uh, some TV show, and the guy messed up. He messed up royal, royally. And, and so we come in, you know, we went shopping, grocery shopping, come inside, and I said, guys, stop. Let's leave right now. They said, why? I said, they're mad at a guy, and we're a guy, and so we need to leave right now. Now, <laughs> so we started backing up. I'm like, yes, please. But I, I, I'm really, I'm excited. I'm excited for you know, what Beacon Church is doing. Uh, they have become uh, the very thing that they're named. That that source of light. That source of um, uh, uh, of hope. Like that beacon of hope in such a dark and broken world. And the reality is, you know, we we all are broken and wounded. Uh, but I don't allow the brokenness and woundedness to no longer be an excuse, right? Uh, and too often, we as a church, we have allowed that to be an excuse, so we settle for mediocrity. And there's no, no, no more time for a mediocre Christian. And what do I mean by that? Uh, mediocrity or mediocre means doing just enough to get by. So my Christian walk becomes mediocre because I do just enough to get by. I, I create the boxes to check and say, so, yep, church, at least three times a month. Uh, I prayed, you know, for my, my meal, uh, you know, before, before I ate. I uh, prayed for somebody, uh, and I did my random act of kindness. I'm checked, I'm good. But <laughs> often we have, you know, financial goals, right? So we set a goal, five, ten year goal. Uh, you know, physically we have a goal. We, I, want, I want a six pack, right? And uh, some, some, for, for some of us, you know, it, it stays in the refrigerator. But still, there's a goal, right? <laughs> uh, but how often do we have a spiritual goal? Where do we want to be spiritually in the next couple of years? Where do we want to be spiritually in the next couple of months? And so I, I, I put a demand on the church to really step up our game. And, and why? Because it, the world is looking. The world is in need. The world is desperate. And I believe that the life, death, and resurrection, I ended this service off last service with this, is that the life, death, and resurrection is the best answer for ultimate reality. The gospel speaks to the ailments. You know, so, hey, I tried alcohol. Yeah, try the gospel. Right? I tried drugs. Try the gospel. Right? I tried this. Try the gospel. I'm telling you, if you landed the gospel and let it go through the authentic progression, there's something that happens. You know, there's something that just, just transforms you into an individual where, where you, you get to a place where people look at you and say, wow, you look different. You smell different. There's something about you, and it's the gospel. And so I, 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 I come with an excitement to really say, church, we got to do better. We can do better. And I wrote this book called Unapologetic Christianity, Bold Living in a Chaotic World. And his book stems from this, this, this uh, uh, situation that happened with me and my family. So we're out at dinner and we're hanging out. And my kids, especially the younger ones, they argue about who's going to pray over dinner, right? Because they, they go um, and um, they always pray, but they want to pray for dinner, right? So they're arguing and 
Uh, it, it's nice because the wait staff came to the table and we started praying and waited and stuff like that. And my my son, you know, ends up winning the 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 the, the toss, uh, the coin toss, and he ends up praying. And and at the end of the prayer, I hear over my shoulder the uh, this this couple talking. And they said, "Why why can't they just keep that at home?" Right? And I, why, why can't they, you know, why do they have to have it here in this world? And in and, and, and the B.C. Jamal, right, for those who understand, that, you know, because the, 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 I was born and raised in Brooklyn, uh, right, you know, and, and um, I, uh, that, there's a song back in the days called I'm Gonna Stay Saved, right? And I, I had to push, because my salvation is tested, especially when I'm driving on the highway. I'm that guy in the left lane on your back, flash me I get out the left lane. See, the left lane is the passing lane, right? I got a, somebody here with, with me, right? I'm a, right, thank you. So I'm, I'm in the left lane. That's the passing lane. Also, what we call the money lane. You know why it's the money lane? Because more than likely, they probably got enough money to pay the ticket they're going to get for the speeding. <laughs> so I hear this, and I'm like, Lord, have mercy. And, and you know, I used to go to fighting, but now I, I go to giving people the finger, right? And I'm like... Like, ah, right, see, I got you. I'm like, Pastor, well, you know, Pastor Trevor, what kind of pastor do you have up here? I'm like, uh, you know, because, you know, and how many of us go like that? You're lucky I'm saved, right? How many of us can go like that, right? And, and so I, I, I get upset. I call my dad. I'm like, Dad, we, we need to start a movement. I said, we need to start a movement. And the text that I landed at to help support my movement was, is a text from Acts. And it's Peter. And Peter, they're out there uh, ministering after the, 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 the uh, day of uh, Pentecost and individuals being saved, people being healed. And, and, and the, 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 the courts and the Sadducees and scribes are still dumbfounded because they thought after killing Jesus and, 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 and this all would end. And ne- next thing you know, the, the movement of the church, the progression of the Holy Spirit just moving into society just increases and picks up. And now Peter and John, they, uh, they're walking around and somebody says, well, well, save me. He said, I don't have anything to give you, right, to the young man who was crippled at the gates. He said, but get up and walk. And they see these individuals and they're walking and they're talking and they're doing things that's astonishing. They said, man, wasn't this supposed to stop? And here it is, Peter and John are at uh, court, and they're deciding what they're going to do. Are they going to kill Peter and John? Are they going to stone them? But there was so much attention that happened to this environment. And they go to verse 18, and, and they argue with the individuals, and they say, okay, look, cut, cut this out, right? Cut it out, and you'll be good. If you stop doing what you're doing, you're going to be good. And it says, they called them back and warned them. That they were no longer, I mean, they, 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 uh, on no account ever again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John spoke right back. Whether it is right in God's eyes to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. As for us, there's no question we can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. And it's something that happens when you get into this encounter with this all-loving, all-powerful, all-saving God. There's there's something that happens. Like like somebody asked me, you know, I was doing mission work in in, in, uh, Australia. And they said, why are you you so excited to talk about this God? I'm an atheist. I don't believe in this God. I said, well, something, when you have something that's so good, you want to share it. So I'm a foodie. Right? Right? So we've got the foodies here. And when you go to a restaurant or you eat a particular dish, like my wife makes this dish. She makes spaghetti, no, uh, uh, baked ziti for me. But she just doesn't do baked ziti, right? Uh, once again, this is, uh, are, we, are we in a judge-free zone? All right. So she takes bacon, makes the bacon, takes the bacon, puts it to the side, and then she takes the beef and cooks it in the bacon grease, right? See, are we still in the judge-free zone? So you can imagine the dish, right? So I can go on, but I'm hungry, right? I want you to say focus. I don't want anybody, somebody's still stuck at the bacon and ziti, right? Come back, come back. But it's so good that I tell people about it because of how good it is. And often we as Christians uh, 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 try to quiet down our walk with God, but when you get to a place where this walk is so good, 
when God has shown up in some mighty ways, when God has done some great things in your life, when you, you, you receive a check that you weren't expecting, when you receive healing that you weren't expecting, you can't keep it to yourself. So John, Peter's like, look, you decide, but for me, this is too good to be kept to myself. I got to share it, you know? So I go to my dad. I said, man, dad, I got, I got, I got the idea. It's called Don't Shush Me is the Movement. He said, don't shush me. I said, yeah, don't shush me because I don't want people to tell me to be quiet. I said, my Christianity is not something I could turn down, not something I could turn off. There's no on and off switch in my Christianity. This is who I am. Love it, love it like it, or leave it alone. And he said, don't shush me. I said, you stuck on that? Yes, daddy, don't shush me. This is what God has delivered in my head. It's, it's, it's here. He said, don't shush me. I said, okay, what's wrong with don't shush me? So we go through the process and, and start breaking it down. And he said, well, what are you really trying to say? I said, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for my Christian walk. And sometimes we find ourselves apologizing because we make people feel uncomfortable with our Christian walk. And I realized that, 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 that if you're walking your walk a certain way, you should make people feel uncomfortable. That's not the goal, but that's a byproduct. I got a friend that's been quitting smoke. He's, he's going to quit smoking for the past five years, every time I walk around him, like, I'm like, yo, what's up? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I don't say anything about him smoking, but, you know, you know he's looking like a fiend, too. You know? <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, I didn't say anything, but there's something that, that, that just starts coming, falling off of you as you walk this walk where people feel convicted in a way that they know that what they're doing is wrong and they got to make a change. That's why I tell people, I said, there's five things that your life, your, your, your life should do when you walk in the walk. I said, number one, you should live this life, this Christian life so good that you make people want what you have. Some people, some Christians make Christianity look ugly. Some Christians make Christianity look so, so stank, like, I, I don't want that. Like, you call yourself a Christian and you're going through what you're going through, and, and <laughs> I, I'm afraid to ask you to pray for me, and I've seen you barely can pray for yourself. So you should walk this walk where it makes you, it looks so good. People, want, I want what you have. How many times you drive in your car, you, you try to, you know, make it look good and people, because you know people are like, oh, I like that car. I want that car. You got some pair of shoes, you, go, you get fly, you know. <laughs> pull, pull out the nice, nice shoes, and you, you know, you're just looking in the mirror. <laughs> right? And you, people want what you have. But then as they see you going through your struggles, they say, wow. I've seen you go through your trials. Because the reality is everybody is either going into a storm or in a storm or coming out of a storm. Everybody's either about to go into a storm or in a storm or about to come out of a storm. And when people watch us and how we interact and, and, and we, we come in and out of the storms and we still walk this walk with God, they go to a place and say, wow, I need that in my life. I was at the brink of like letting it all go, but I need that in my life. I saw how you, how you came out of your furnace. I saw how even though you were in the furnace, you didn't even look like you were being burnt. You didn't look like, you didn't smell like you were, like the hairs of your head were singed. There's something about your walk. I need that right now. All because you're living this life. And then so they go from wanting what you have, they say, well, I need what you have. And, and you did there's a conversion and people getting saved and stuff like that. But then we got to get to a point, church, where people might not want what you have. They might not need what you have. But they got to start respecting the God you serve. And so we walk a walk where people start respecting the God you serve. Because if you look at it, right, let's, 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 talk, like, like, let's talk real. Christianity is one of the religions that's always on the table to be made fun of. They won't do anything to the Quran. They won't do anything to Allah. But when it comes to Christianity, it's always on the table. Yeah, let's create jokes. We are the highest rated, number one uh, made fun of religion on all TV. And I believe that we're part of the blame. We need to start living this life where people say, okay, I understand that, but I can't really disrespect their God because I've seen the power of their God. I've seen what their God does. I've seen what happens 
You know, and, 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 and there's a story in, in the Bible, Daniel, and I, I'm, I'm, I didn't preach this first service. I'm, I'm switching up the service. Is that all right, Pastor Trevor? <laughs> Do I have to preach the same message as that service? No, we're good? Y'all got my back, right? Because I, I, I say we're good. All right, I got the thumbs up. Because there's a certain reality, right? There's, there's three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel chapter 3. They're hanging out, you know, and King, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, gets this, this epiphany, right? It was a, a stupid epiphany, but he gets this epiphany. Ooh, can I say that from the stage, stupid? <laughs> All right, okay. And, and, <laughs> and, and he gets this epiphany, and this epiphany, he gets, you know, I'm going to erect this statue, this, this huge statue. And not only am I going to erect the statue, I'm, people are going to have to pray and worship to the statue because I am the man, right? Uh, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar does this, and he says, at the sound of the music instruments, these individuals are going to have to bow. He said, they're going to have to bow to this. And if anybody uh, doesn't bow, they're going to die. They're going to be killed off. And, and so here it goes. The instruments are going, you know, the bass is going, you know, come, come on the kick drum. They're getting it in, right? And, and these three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, does not bow. And, you know, these individuals saw that and they started snitching on them and, and telling them. And they said, well, remember the three Hebrew boys you took care of, you fed, you were conscious of their diet. You know, you, you, you didn't put them in a, the type of slavery they could have been in. They had great living. Everything's smooth for them. They disrespected you and didn't, they didn't bow. And Shadrach, I mean, and Nebuchadnezzar was upset. He said, wow, okay, let me speak to them. Maybe this, something, something happened. Maybe they didn't hear the instruments, right? And, you know, this is Jamalism. It's not written in the Bible. Uh, so don't look for what I'm saying. My, my version of the story is not in the Bible. All right, this is how I get it. I, I, what, what, what translation is he reading it from? Right? This is, this is how I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling my story, right? So, so King Nebuchadnezzar, nah, they probably heard, they didn't hear it. They were probably you know, doing something and missed, missed the, the sound. So he said, t- bring them over here. Let me talk to them. And he, he speaks to them. And he says, look, guys, um, what happened? Tell me what happened. You know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe that you didn't you know, bow. And he said, look, Nebuchadnezzar, we didn't bow. He said, what? He said, after all I've done for you, I looked out for you. I hooked you up. You know, I gave you a little, you know, I didn't give you the scraps of the table. I gave you the, the best of the, uh, 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 of the dishes. I took your diet. You wanted to, I gave you the best fruit and, and vegetables that you wanted. And well, how are you going to disrespect me like that? And, you know, and once again, this is Jamalism. This is not. And they go to him and say, look, King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow or worship any of your gods. We understand your decree, but we're not going to do that. And then King Nebuchadnezzar gets mad. He gets furious and he's upset. He said, well, how dare you? How dare you disrespect me after all I've done? He said, look, I'm going to give you another chance. He said, look, he, he said, I'm going to give you another chance because if you don't, what manner of God is able to save you? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, look, I know our God. I know the capacity of our God. I know, I, 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 well, in my finite mind, I, I, we, we understand what he has the ability to do. We know that this is the God who, who created life uh, out of nothing. He, you know, he, he's timeless, spaceless, immaterial. He's personal. He's, he's just this individual that, that, that our finite words can't even really explain who he is. So we just land at the highest conceivable being. Anything that you can think of, that's who he is at that level. And, and, and so we're confident that he can deliver us. We're confident. Like, there's, there's no doubt in our mind that he, does, that he can't deliver us. Like, we know that we know that we know that we know that the power of our God can deliver us from this situation. And then there's a twist. Because a lot of us are at that place where, yes, we know the power of our God. We've seen him show up. And we have these questions that we give to God and, and we ask him. And, 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 but quite often, we're not ready for his answer of no. And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and they said that, that even if he doesn't, see, at that point, that's where, 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 where the rubber meets the road. That's where your faith is tested. Because I was talking to a, a lady earlier today, and I said, look, faith that's not tested is faith that cannot be trusted. I'll say that again. Faith that is not tested is faith that can't be trusted. And sometimes we get to a place where we petition God for certain things and he answers us with a no. 
And then we start doubting the nature of this God. So is our belief in God based on all the yes? Or is our belief in God based on the reality that he's the highest conceivable being? There's nothing above him, nothing better than him, nothing greater than him. So Nebuchadnezzar said, well, God can save you. He said, oh, God can. But even if he doesn't, we're good. And often there's a lot of Christians that can't make that last statement. Even if he doesn't, we're good. So Nebuchadnezzar gets mad, turns up the furnace seven times hotter. It's, it's so hot that the people who were throwing them into the furnace died off. They died because it was so hot. Nebuchadnezzar, they, they're in there hanging out. Nebuchadnezzar looks through the window and he says, look, I thought we tied them up and threw them in there. Now they're walking around chilling. You know, they got, they're doing a cha-cha slide. <laughs> he said, wait, didn't we send three individuals in there? Now there's four. What is going on? And he sees them free. Because when you're living in a life of conviction, you still can find freedom in your storm. When you live in a life of conviction, you can find peace in your storm. And Nebuchadnezzar tells him, come out, come out, come out. This is crazy. I can't believe this. And, and, and he said, look, you don't even smell like you were in the furnace. He said, you don't even look like you've gone through something. He said, because of this, I'm going to put a decree. If anybody says anything about your God, King Nebuchadnezzar never accepted the God of Israel as his God, but he, he, he accepted the power of their God and started defending them and respected them. He said, I respect your God so much so because of your lifestyle and your convictions that anybody says anything about your God, not even my God, but your God, they're dead. Their families are dead. All because of their lifestyle. They weren't out there preaching in a soapbox. So number one, <coughs> you should live a lifestyle that looks so good, people want what you have. Number two, you should live a lifestyle so good that people say, I need what you have. Number three, you should walk a lifestyle that, that, that people start respecting the God you serve. You don't give them an excuse to disrespect our God. You don't give them any ammo to disrespect our God. Our God is a God that we should have always awe for. Number four. Right, that's number four now? You should live a lifestyle in such a way that people who don't even believe in your God has confidence in the power of your God. How many of you have individuals that don't believe in your God but sit there and say, can you say a prayer for me? My mother's going through something. My dad's going through something. My sister's going, say a prayer for me. There's something that I've watched how you lived your life. I hear the reports and the stories and the statistics of the God you serve and how he's showing up in a mighty way. There's something that happens. I might not believe in him, but there's a power that is, is, is coming out of this lifestyle that I cannot ignore. I need you to pray. You know, I got a biblical story for this. So now you got Daniel chapter, I think we're in chapter 6 now. And here is Daniel. He's doing his thing. He's vice, you know, uh, over the, uh, uh, vice region over the land. And he's like almost like second or third in charge. And he, uh, you know, once again, you get haters. When you live in a Christian lifestyle, you're going to have haters. All right, just that, that, that's, let, let that be known. All right, don't, don't be like, oh, I can't believe people hate on me. No, gonna, people are going to hate on you because you're, you're going to make li living a Christian life look so good, people can't handle it. That's going to be the reality. When you leave here, Beacon Church is like, wow, they live in that Christian life. That looks so good. I, 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 how happy they are is just annoying me. <laughs> they enjoying life too much so. It's, 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 it's irking me. You got individuals that's going to hate like that because they are in a place where they're so broken they can't have fun or be happy with somebody successful. So Daniel's doing his thing. Once again, he has the haters. And, and, and they, they, they tried to trap him, and they looked in his, they said, looked in his closet to see if they could find something to, to bring up against him. And, and Daniel was like, no, um, I'm good, and, and they couldn't find anything, so they said, let's go after his religion. Does that sound like something familiar? 
Let's go after his religion. And, and, and they said, well, well, you know, Darius, make a decree that, that uh, this is Jamalism, right? So you, if you want the full story, go back to the biblical account, all right? Uh, it, you know, so they said, look, we got an idea. We got an idea that we want to share. All right, I'm sorry, we're going to behave, all right? So, so he says, he says uh, let's make a decree that anybody prays to their God for the next couple of days, well, uh, for some time, that this should be uh, thrown in the lines then. They're going to be killed. And what did, so once he signed the decree, what did Daniel do? He went and did what he normally did. That's not going to stop him. And, he, and he, he didn't hide it. He left the windows open so that the haters could see him still enjoying his relationship with God. And he said he did what he normally did and prayed. And what happened? They went and snitched on him, told on him. He gets caught up. And Darius feels bad that he wrote the decree because it's how it's penalizing the freedom of his religion. And here it goes. He says, look, Daniel, I got to do this because of the decree. But I'm confident that your God's going to deliver you. I'll say that again. He says, he says, he says look, I had to do this decree, I, 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 but, but I, I believe that the ease in putting you in the lion's den comes from the confidence I have and the ability for your God to deliver you. So number four, we live a life, this Christian difference, in such a way that people are so confident in the power of your God. And number five, as I wrap up, we have to live this Christian difference in such a way that people who don't even believe in your God will be out there evangelizing for your God. What do I mean by that? So Darius goes, Daniel's in the lion's den. He's chilling for a couple of days. The, the lion, God shut the mouth of the lion. Darius comes and removes, uh, gets uh, Daniel out, throws in the haters, right? They get eaten by the lion. And Darius says, wow, this is amazing how your God delivered you. Y'all should check out his God. And he's, making, he's telling people as a king that didn't believe in his God. He didn't, still didn't accept the God of Israel as his God, but he promoted and evangelized for their God, all because of Daniel's lifestyle. They said the number one reason that people are turning away or don't respect Christianity is because what they say out of their mouth is not in line with what they, how they live in. And the reality is that light travels faster than sound, so what people see in your lifestyle affects them faster and greater than what comes out of your mouth. So my question is, because the world is watching, we have control over what they see. What are we going to allow the world to see about these Christians that claim that they're different and there's no difference? Is your walk going to cause somebody to want what you have? Is your walk going to cause somebody to, to say, I need what you have? Is, is your walk going to cause somebody to say, man, I got to respect their God because their God is always showing up. And I see that in the lifestyle. Is your walk going to cause somebody to say, no, I, I, got, I, got, I, I got confident that you're going to be okay. I know you're going through something, but by the way your God's been showing up in your life, I, I, I believe you're going to be okay. Is your lifestyle being lived in such a way that people are going to help evangelize about your God even though they don't believe in your God. See, there's something significant about the lifestyle of the Christian that we sometimes neglect because we try to say we're a Christian and we hope that that goes further than living out that Christian difference. So when I wrote this book, I was 
committed to pushing this idea of living this Christian difference. It's not easy. Believe you me, Romans chapter 7, latter part of chapter 7, some of 8, you know, the, and, and, and the, the reality is the struggle is real. I'm telling you, the struggle is real. You know, even Paul, he's saying, he's saying he said, look, I, I, I want to do good. He said, I, I know to do good. I, I understand the, the concept of doing good. But, but, but there's something that happens. You know, he said, I, 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 I have a desire to do good. I, I want to do the things that are right. But something happens that, that, that always sabotages this very desire to do right. He said, but I have an answer for it. Because he was like, woe is me. He said, but the answer is Christ. And the reality is, no matter what you go through, if you authentically seek Christ, he will authentically transform you. Let us pray. Father God, always acknowledge in your authority, your sovereignty, and your love for every one of us. So right now we pray for the individuals watching online or sitting in this room, that your love, your mercy, your kindness, your forgiveness will pour down and rain over their lives right now. We pray that you will start reshaping the way they see life and change their perspective and understand that they have a role to play. It's not just the pastor's job to grow the church, but it's the individual's job as well. So we pray for ownership right now. We pray for a spirit of peace, love, kindness, longevity, long-suffering. We pray for the leadership of this church that you will continue to direct and guide and guard in their, their paths, that they will stay and step with you like the scripture says. Since we live by the Spirit, let us stay and step, keep in step with the Spirit. So Lord, we pray for conviction and sin in our hearts so heavy that there's nothing that will come in our lives that will separate us from the love of Christ. So we say thank you for it. We pray for Pastor uh, Robert, as he's traveling back from India, and his wife and, and the family, we pray for Pastor Trevor and all the other pastors that are here supporting the vision of Beacon Church. In Jesus' name, amen.